By the time it comes to writing your plan, you've already got your research question written and you've got a pretty good idea of the direction that you're taking your assignment. It's tempting to get straight into this by just writing a step-by-step -step guide of how you'll collect your data, but there's a lot more that goes into writing a plan than that. Here, I'm going to guide you through the marking criteria and show you what goes into a good plan. Broadly speaking, there are three things you need to do when writing a plan. The marking criteria states that a high scoring report designs a repeatable method, justifies the sampling strategy and describes the risk assessment and ethical considerations. We'll start with that first point. You'll know your method is probably repeatable if, after reading your method, someone else can do your experiment without talking to you about it. And if they did the experiment in the same place as you, they would get the same results. So what's this without talking to you about it bit? Think about it like this. Don't write, use a reasonable amount of solution when you could write, for example, add 10 milliliters. Don't write after waiting a while when you could write, leave the material to stand for 24 hours. Collect your results is not so good, but record the time in seconds for each sample is better. You get the idea. If you use vague statements, anyone else who wanted to use your method would need to look for clarification, so the method isn't really repeatable. A final example is, don't say, process your data. A better alternative might be something like, calculate something or other using the formula such and such. I want to really emphasize this point. A plan should include what you will do with your data. Any data processing with graphs, calculations, anything you do with your data should be described here. And what about getting the same results? Well, imagine your investigation involves estimating the population of these yellow flowers. Your method describes selecting three areas at random to place your quadrant. You sample these three particular places. And as you can see, there are two, zero, and one flowers within each quadrat giving you an estimated abundance of one flower per square meter. If someone else comes along and repeats your method, they might randomly select these particular areas to place their quadrat. If we look at their results, they'll conclude that there is an average of five flowers per square meter. In short, the method is not repeatable because your sampling strategy, which involves collecting only three samples, is not appropriate. Next, your method must be appropriate to the research question. For this, consider what answer does your research question need? Is it a correlation, a productivity value, a mass change? Whatever your research question requires, make sure your method can find an answer to it. It's a good time to say here, don't stick with a bad research question. It's okay to go back and change it at this point if you want to. Next is the idea about sufficient relevant data. Make sure you collect enough samples to get a valid conclusion. It's difficult for me to give specific advice on how many samples are appropriate because it depends entirely on your assignment and there's no magic number. But for many assignments, you should be mindful that you need to collect enough samples to get a reliable average. In a good assignment, the student's report justifies the choice of sampling strategy used. Let's say part of your assignment involves answering the question, how much electricity does a student at my school use? To find out, you plan to find the energy use of common items like lights and laptops, then create a survey to find out how much time each student uses these for. For your sampling strategy, consider how you'll get the data, you decided to use a survey in this case, and consider who will answer it. Will you survey everyone? Survey just your class? Are the students randomly selected? Will you choose five people per year group? All of these kinds of decisions make up your sampling strategy. Maybe you decide it's best to use a survey and ask 10 students per group to fill it out. To choose them, assign numbers to each student and select them at random using a random number generator. The justification for using a survey is that they're cheap, convenient and easily shared. You're using 10 students per year group because there are 30 students in a year group and one third is a good representative sample. You must sample each year group to be representative of the whole school. And choosing students using a random number generator removes any bias in selection. The third step in the planning criteria is describing the risk assessment and ethical considerations where applicable. Let's start with the risk assessment. 
you need to think about the hazards, which are the things that could go wrong and harm someone, and the risks, which refers to how likely each thing is to go wrong. We'll consider an experiment where we want to collect air pollution samples at increasing distance from the road. We're going to list our hazards, consider how severe each one is, and how likely it is to happen. Then we'll think about safety measures we can take to minimise the risk or be prepared for the hazard. A minor hazard is cuts and scratches. In terms of severity, that's fairly low, and assuming you're careful, it's not very likely to happen. As you're working near cars, that's also a potential source of injury. That could be life-threatening, so it's very high in severity. The chances of it happening, however, are very low. There are others you could probably think of, but we'll stick with these for now. Let's think about what the numbers mean before we talk about safety measures. Using a matrix like this is common in risk assessments. They're often colour-coded. We plot the severity and likelihood of each hazard on the table, and depending on the colour they fall on, we can determine if it is low enough to be acceptable, or too high for us to safely proceed. Often, we just need to put some measures in place to reduce the risk to a lower level, or have a plan in place in case something happens. For cuts and scratches, we can't really reduce the risk, but since the severity is low, just having a first aid kit available is fine. To minimise the risk of injuries from cars, a sensible measure is to wear a high visibility vest. With this measure in place, the risk remains relatively low. I should point out that there are lots of versions of this matrix out there, and I'd recommend using a standardised version. Your school might even have one that they use for field trips, so ask your teacher. There are a few reasons why you might need to take ethical considerations into account. You need to outline these if you have experiments involving animals. Consider whether there is an alternative. Could plants be used instead? If there's a possibility of damaging an ecosystem, discuss the steps you'll take to avoid destroying anything. If you're collecting data from people, consider the permission you need from them to collect it. It's important for this bit that you review the IB Animal Experimentation Policy and comply with it. <laughs>